Pretty famous uh, story here in Numbers chapter 16. And one thing we always want to make sure we, we are really paying attention when we see events like this happen in the Bible. Now, this is the only recorded event where God has opened up the earth and swallowed up people alive like to go down into hell. So what these people did, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, was extremely serious and extremely grievous in the sight of God, for God to open up the earth and swallow them whole. Amen. And, um, you know, this is something that I think we all need to, to take to heart and, and to, to be on guard for and to watch out for. And ultimately, we're, we're going to get into this, but um, to keep your finger here in number 16 because we're coming, we're going to spend most of the time through number 16 and kind of study out what happened here and what was going on. But turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number one. Just go forward a little bit in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter number one. And what we're we preaching about this morning is a subject of respect Amen. and having respect for the man of God and having respect for other people in general. And that's one thing that Korah, Dathan, and Abiram did not have was any respect for Moses or any respect for Aaron and, and were puffed up in themselves and ended up getting swallowed up by the pit. And we're going to get a lot more into detail about that. But since I'm going to be teaching on the subject of respect now, Respect in the Bible, I'm using that word respect because it's something that we all understand today and we use. Um, the Bible, you're going to find mostly it's going to tell you not to be a respecter of persons and amen and amen and that's true. And I just want to get this clear out of the way because the word that I, when I use respect, it's probably a little bit more closely associated with honor in the Bible, but you know, I'm going to be using terminology that we use today. So, you know, and just to clear up any confusion, uh, Deuteronomy chapter one, look at verse number 17. The Bible says you shall not respect persons in judgment. So when you see, the, the, you know, because over and over again, you're going to find the Bible saying not to respect persons, not a respecter of persons. But when I use the word respect, don't think like, oh, wait a minute, you know, why are you teaching us to respect people? The Bible says not to be a respecter of persons. They're two different things. So when it says here not to be a respecter of persons, look what it says, in judgment. It says, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear it. This is a very good verse that, that kind of wraps up and encapsulates what the Bible's talking about. We're talking about not to be a respecter of persons. It means you don't just, you basically treat everybody equal when it comes to judgment. When it comes to applying God's word. You're not lifting up one person above another in, say, where someone has an issue against someone else and you're trying to determine what's right and what's wrong. It doesn't matter the parties who are involved. You can't have respect in persons in that way because you have to give the judgment to God. So whether someone's famous or powerful or have a lot of money, you know, and they get busted for doing something, you, you can't throw judgment out the window. That would be a, a respecter of persons. But that's a different concept than showing respect or having respect for somebody who's in authority or having respect for somebody who's in a position that deserves respect. They're two different things because showing respect or showing honor unto somebody, recognizing the position that they're in or position that God has put them in and recognizing a certain authority that they have is biblical and scriptural. So I just, I just want to get that out of the way. Turn back if you would to number 16 because hopefully you can see that, that, that clear distinction there that I'm not talking about, you know, and again, this is, this is going to be very careful. I'm not talking about a God man. I'm not talking about a Pope. I'm not talking about someone, you know, we don't believe that there's somebody that's just, you know, everything that they say is true. You know, the Bible says, no, let God be true and every man a liar. We, 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 you know, we're not, we're not in the business of, of lifting up men and exalting them higher than they ought to be lifted up. But at the same time, we need to be showing respect. I mean, the Apostle Paul is a perfect example of this. The Apostle Paul was someone who he himself was concerned and he didn't want to be lifted up above measure. He said that's why he had a thorn in the flesh. And, and he didn't want to be lifted up and lifted up in pride in that people because, you know, he had a lot of scripture that he was expounding. I mean, look at all the epistles that the Apostle Paul was responsible for that adding to God's word. He was someone that easily could have been looked up to as someone who was more than just a man. And we don't want to do that and exalt someone up and make an idol out of a man. 
But at the same time, did the Apostle Paul command respect? You better believe he did. And there's a lot of people, especially at the church at Corinth, that were kind of treating him really poorly and, and talking down about him and saying, oh, yeah, he writes these letters and they're all real powerful, but that's not the way he's going to be when he gets here. And just completely disrespecting the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul had to come back and rebuke him and said, no, you know what, when I show up, I'm going to be exactly the same way that the letters are. And we see this concept all throughout, but I can't see it spelled out any more clearly than we see in Numbers chapter 16. Look down at verse number 1, Numbers 16. The Bible says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Now, right off the bat, we got to understand, you know, when you read through the book of Exodus, you see God chose the Levites, first of all, to be the ones in charge of the service to the Lord. So God chose the tribe of Levi out of all the other tribes to be the ones that he chose. You're going to be doing the service of the Lord. You're going to be, you know, rearing up the tabernacle and they're moving around and performing the sacrifices and doing all the service to God. And then of the Levites, he chose specifically the line of Aaron to be the priests. And he says, these are going to be the priests that are going to come and minister. They're going to be, able, they're going to be the ones that go into the holies of holies. They're going to be the ones that do this specific job. And God outlines that and says, this is the way it's going to be. So the charge we have here from Korah, Korah was a Levite. So he was of the people that had a job to do, but he wasn't of the priesthood. It wasn't his job to be in the priesthood position that Aaron was in. The one who's kind of, you know, a, definitely one of the, the main leaders. You know, Moses was the, the main leader. And then you have Aaron and, and going down from there and Aaron's sons. And they were the leadership of this congregation in the wilderness. These were the ones in charge. These were the ones commanding and kind of directing the way that things were going to be. And Korah doesn't like that. And then you have these other Dathan and Byram and on. It says they're sons of Reuben. They're not even of the tribe of Levi at all. They have nothing to do with this service. And they're saying, oh, you bring too much upon yourself. And they're basically what they're saying is, who do you think you are? They say, look, isn't all the congregation holy? Aren't we all separated unto God? Aren't we all God's people? So who do you think you are to be up there and tell us what to do and everything else? And this is the attitude that they had. It's a rebellious, wicked attitude. Now we see here that there's these wicked people that are trying to split the church in the wilderness because they're blatantly just attacking the leadership. The story starts off by identifying the people responsible, specifically by name, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, on. These men were able to get 250 princes on their side. And notice that, don't read over this stuff. It says there's 250 princes. Princes are people who are in charge. They're, you know, they're, they're ruling over a smaller group of people. And it says that they were famous in the congregation, men of renown. People looked up to these people. So when Korah, Dathan, and Byramon, they gather together, they, they wickedly go in and they try convincing these 250 people to come on their side and to speak out against Moses and Aaron. Now, you don't get 250 people overnight to join your cause. So these people have been murmuring and, and complaining about Moses and Aaron and, and trying to recruit these people. And they, and they go after people, hey, man, if we could get these princes on our side... You know, they have a lot of influence over the people. And the reason why these four men are, are singled out here is because they are extremely wicked and they're the ones responsible for all of this, this huge uh, uprising against Moses and Aaron. And it's important to point out their tactics because wicked people behave the same way today. They work behind the scenes for a while trying to turn people away from the leadership. They try to win over the congregation by flattering and exalting them and then essentially accusing the leaders of being the ones who are lifted up and prideful. 
when it's them themselves who are the proud ones and, and want more for themselves. Amen. And we see here, Moses and Aaron, I mean, what are they doing? They're just doing the job that God told them to do. Amen. They're not doing anything more. They're not adding to God's words. They're not looking to be lifted up. They're serving the Lord. Amen. And especially Moses, we see in this story the humility of Moses. I mean, the Bible says, and we're going to get to that verse a little later, I mean, he was, more, he was more meek than like anybody in the whole world at that time. He was the most humble, meek man. And we see here, as soon as they bring this accusation against them, saying, who do you think you are? What does Moses do? Verse 4 says, when Moses heard, he fell on his face. He was humble even before these wicked people. But he still rebukes them. So don't get me, you know, he didn't, he didn't just, he wasn't weak. He was being humble. He was making sure they know, look, I'm not lifting up myself. But at the same time, when we keep reading, we're going to see he gives them a very strong rebuke and he puts them in their place because they're wrong. And they need to be called out for being wrong. And we're going to see here in verse number five, he doesn't show any compassion on them. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, and he spake unto Korah and all his company saying, even tomorrow, the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do, take you censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. See, now Moses is turning it back around him. Look, oh, you think I'm taking too much on myself? No, you're taking too much on yourself. You bring the censers. Go ahead, bring up the, the, the incense, because that's the job that God told the priesthood to do. So they say, we'll see, we'll, we'll establish this right now. You want to have this job? We'll see if God accepts it. We'll see if God is accepting you. Yeah. And I, I love this because Moses just takes charge. You know, people are accusing him of being too lifted up and stuff. But what's interesting is that what he tells them to do, they still end up listening to him and do it. <laughs> you know, like, like, this is how we're going to prove it. And they don't say, no, no, we're not going to do it that way. They do it. They listen to him. Verse number eight. And Moses said unto Korah, here I pray you, sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. So he's saying, look, why do you think this is just some, some minor thing? It's not some small deal. You already have a great job. Why don't you just be happy in the work that God has appointed you to do? Why don't you just... Put your eyes down, put your head down, get to work and do your job. You've already received honor from the Lord by being separated to do this work. Why isn't that enough for you? Because he's lifted up in pride. He's full of himself. Nothing's ever going to be enough for him. Verse number 10, the Bible says, And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? He's saying, look, who are we? Why are you so complaining about Aaron? God's the one who gave us the job. God's the one who gave you the job as a Levite for your service. What, why are you murmuring against Aaron? What did he do? He's just doing his job. And Moses gets very angry with these wicked men because that's where we are. Look, you're going to see this multiple times. These men are wicked. Now, again, it's easier, it's easier to read it and to see that. And it's harder to make the application when you see almost the exact same thing happening. We have a tendency to think when you see the same exact pattern happening, oh, well, there's a misunderstanding. Oh, they believe a little bit different. And you start thinking that, well, they're not really wicked. They're not that bad. No, actually, these people are extremely wicked. And when people come into a church and try splitting a church right. and try gathering people against the leadership, against a man of God, against someone who's, who's preaching hard and doing, winning souls and doing the job that God has appointed them to do, and people come in and try to lead people astray, they're wicked. Amen. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says that Moses was very wroth. That means he was extremely angry. That's like wrath. And said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. 
I have not taken one S from them, neither have I hurt one of them. Moses is even saying to God, God, look, don't show any pity on them. Have no compassion on them. I didn't do anything against these people, yet they're turning around and stabbing me in the back and falsely accusing me and trying to split up this congregation. We're going to see here the effect that Korah actually had on the congregation as a whole. Look at verse number 19. Because this is extremely damaging, and this is why these men were so wicked. Verse number 19, And Korah gathered all the congregation against them. All the congregation against Moses and Aaron. <clears throat> unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. So what's God's response? <laughs> Moses and Aaron, stand over here. I'm going to destroy everybody. I mean, the whole congregation, you know, all the, you know, these wicked people and everyone who's following these wicked people. That's God's response. But look at Moses' response. Verse number 22. And they fell upon their faces, Moses and Aaron, that is. This is talking about Moses and Aaron fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? We see here the hearts of the men of God. They had no sympathy for the wicked deceivers. They had no, no you know, yeah, God, deal with them. But for the followers, for the whole congregation, they still cared about them. Because that's what the, the shepherd does. That's what the, the under shepherd does. The, the, the elders, you know, the, the Moses, the priests, that's what they're doing. They're caring about the people, the congregation, and trying to watch out for these wolves that are going to come in and try to destroy the flock. And they care about them and they love them and say, look, these people were just deceived. You know, don't destroy them. Obviously, they need to get right. But they don't need, you know, but God, please, you know, they're just pleading with God. And look, God's right. He just says, look, we're going to get rid of all of them. And they're pleading with God, saying, God, please don't do that, because they, they love these people. And God often will hearken unto the man of God, especially Moses. I don't know how many times you listen to Moses, when he was just, when God gets fed up with the people because they're so stiff-necked and not willing to listen, they're not willing to serve the Lord, and Moses continues, he's just like, God, you know, please give him another chance. God, please, you know, for your name's sake, just, just don't destroy these people. Over and over again, we see the love of Moses. And, and that type of a man, that you see how wicked it is for people to then go speaking against someone with that kind of heart. Yeah. Jump down to verse number 28. <clears throat> Bible says, And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these, die, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. So basically, this is where he's starting to say, you know what, this is going to prove it to you. Because if these guys just, just die of old age or die of just a normal cause, okay, God didn't send me. And this is where Moses is pronouncing their death. And he's saying, you know what, God's going to take you out, and it's not going to be in a normal way. It's going to be in a way that there is no mistaking that God is involved and that God has chosen me and that these men are wicked. <clears throat> The accusation against Moses was that he was just making stuff up, just preaching out of his own heart, just doing whatever he wanted because they thought that, you know, he was, he was filled up, up with himself and not preaching the word of the Lord and, uh, you know, doing things that he wanted to do, not what God wanted him to do. So he proves them false. He said, okay, you think I'm just saying all this stuff? I'm just coming out of this with my own heart? Well, we'll see if this is from God or not. We'll see how you die. And then, of course, the earth swallows up Korah and his household. You know, basically, he says, okay, congregation, you might want to get away from this guy. You might want to distance, you might want to separate now from this guy because God's judgment's coming upon him. And the earth sw opens up, swallows him up, and then the fire, the Bible says, kills the 250 princes, leaders, men of renown, all those people that they had gathered together as well to, to <clears throat> lead the people against Moses and against Aaron. And a fire kills them all. Now you would think, you would think that this would be enough for the congregation to see and to get right with God, but it wasn't. And again, I think this goes to show the amount of influence and the impact that these wicked men had on the people at large. 
Because, I mean, think, I mean, if you were to see someone, if you see the earth open up, there's this big crack open up in the earth, and the whole house gets swallowed up and go down to hell. I, I don't know about you, but I'd be listening to Moses. Amen. And he's the one who said that this was going to, you know, okay, sorry. But is that what the congregation did? Look at verse number 44. We'll see. Or verse number 41. Verse number 41. The Bible says, But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. They're still deceived. They say, Look, why did you do this? Why did you kill these people of the Lord? They're not people of the Lord. They're wicked. They're deceivers. They're wolves. But they had everybody deceived. And look, we need, and then don't think that these people were just so stupid that, you know, I would never be this dumb. People are people. And the reason why they got to this point is because they were so deceived by these deceivers were so deceitful and they were able to, to get into their heads and to get them to be compassionate and to get them to, you know, just, just completely turn their heads around. We need to make sure and see at this point, they're being the respecters of persons and not respecting God's judgment and God's word. They are caring more about these men than they are about the judgment of God. And I just preached a sermon not that long ago about overcoming emotions, and this is, this, this is the exact thing that we need to be careful about, is that we could stay true to God's word, God's judgment, and exalt that. So look, it's never fun when these things happen, because they're going to happen. They're going to come in the church. church there's, there's always going to be attempts made at church splits, and people try, especially when, you know, when you're doing a good work, when you have like an entire group. I mean, almost everybody that's here this morning was out soul winning yesterday. When you have a group of people that's going out and winning souls to Christ and doing the work that God has set for them, you better expect that, that Satan's not going to just sit there and let everything try to go smoothly. He's going to come in. He's going to send in deceivers to try to, to pit people against each other, pit people against the leadership, and cause the work to cease. Right. And we need to remember that that's what's going to be happening. And we need to keep the proper balance and make sure that we're not respect. And, and you know what? This is going to go for everybody, that we don't respect persons too much, no matter who they are. And stay with God's word. Right. Amen. <clears throat> Jump down to verse number 44 here because we're going to see the hearts of the men of God again. Moses and Aaron, they truly loved the people and they hated the wolves. Verse number 44 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar. And put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. Now get this. The congregation just came back against Moses and Aaron. They say, why did you kill these people? You're the ones responsible. They still didn't get it. But what do they do? God, you know, God's saying, you know what? I've had enough of these people. I've had enough of them. If they still don't get it, I'm just, you know, they're just going to receive their, their righteous judgment. But they still care, Moses and Aaron. They don't, they don't ever give up on the people who are deceived. And, and Moses is like, look, you know, let's make an atonement for them. Let's try to get things right with God, you know, and just, and just do whatever we can to help these people out. And that's the sign of a real man of God. Amen. Someone who's willing to give themselves for the others. I mean, that's a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. I mean, we don't, we don't deserve God's mercy. We're a bunch of sinners. We deserve a punishment of hell. But what did Jesus do? Jesus still loved us enough to come and to die on the cross and pay for all of our sins. And we see here that reflected in the man of God, Moses. You've got a bunch of people. They didn't deserve mercy. They were wrong. They were following these wicked people and allowed themselves to be so deceived that you know, they, they, they still were blaming and murmuring against Moses and Aaron, but they still loved them enough and said, look, these people are still just deceived. 
and they still love them and, and, they're, and they're doing their best to try to, to reconcile uh, their sins with God by, by you know, making atonement and going off and trying to stop the plague. Verse 47 says, And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between, excuse me, between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. That's a lot of people. There's a lot of damage done at the end of the day. These wolves that came in. Now the congregation still was spared and still survived and still remained after this attack. But <clears throat> look at the damage that they caused. It wasn't just to themselves and to the 250 there's another 14,700 that ended up dying as, a, as directly as a result of what they were doing. Because if they weren't doing this, if they didn't come in and try to pit the people against Moses and Aaron, none of this stuff would have happened. <clears throat> but the congregation wouldn't have been so screwed up if they had more respect for the man of God. Think about that. If they had more respect for Moses and Aaron and what they were doing, instead of being murmurers and complainers and... and looking at every little thing that maybe their imperfection, something that they don't, you know, and just trying to, to, to find every little thing to not want, you know, just to not want to listen to them about, as opposed to just respecting the job, the you know, position that God put them in and actually hearing the words of the Lord. Because look, if you're going to find a problem with a man, you're going to be able to do that easily. You want to find a problem with me, go ahead, look close enough, I guarantee you're going to find more than one problem. You don't have to like me as a person. You don't have to like Pastor Anderson as a person. You don't have to like any, any preachers that are preaching the word of God as a person. But if they're preaching God's word, that's ultimately what you have to have respect for and, and be able to listen to what God's saying. You, know, you may not like the way people say things. You may not like, the, you know, so whatever. If it's coming from God's word, though, we need to have respect for that. And, um, you know, day in and day out, you could look at the ministering that Moses and Aaron were doing unto the Lord. And what these people like to do, these, these Korahs and Dathans and Abirams, is they want to get people focused on some small thing, some little incident, and, and overlook the overarching, just, just everything that they've been doing. Amen. They, they try to slander the characters of Moses and Aaron here in this story. But, I mean, what were they doing? I mean, look, look at how much work and, and effort that Moses was putting into the congregation of Israel all the way up to this point. Well, he led them out of Egypt. Right. Yeah. I mean, part of the Red Sea. He was, you know, he was telling them what was right the whole time and everywhere along the line, you know, everything that Moses did for him, he was judging among the people. They would bring the cases to him and, and he was doing all this work and it was selfless. It was for the Lord and it was for the people. But you get a couple loud mouths around, you get a, some proud fools, some wolves that want to come in and, and make some issue out of some small thing and say, oh, who do they, who do they think they are? Nobody, but they're doing the work that God has put forth to do. Amen. They're extremely humble, yet these wicked people are able to turn their minds around and be, oh yeah, well look at, look at the way he did that. Oh, look at, look at this. Who do they think they are? And forgetting about all the work they've been doing and forgetting about just showing all of the fruit of their labors and everything that they're doing and they still allowed themselves to be deceived by these wicked men and they didn't have respect. Now, this has been going on recently. And you know, for any of you that, that, that are online a lot or listen, because we have a lot of visitors this morning, I really, really, really stay out of drama. I don't like the drama. I don't like the fighting and infighting. I don't like things that are going on, especially on social media. You know, there's a lot of that stuff. <clears throat> I just steer clear of. Because it, it's just going to bring a bad name on everything and every, you know, it just doesn't look good yeah. in general. Yeah, right. Okay, and now I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go any further really in depth on that. But when I see what, what really burns me up 
is when I see someone that I know very well and I know personally being slandered and attacked from their character, from people online that, that barely know them or don't know them very much or want to bring up stuff from, from years and years ago, that gets me angry because, you know, Pastor Anderson isn't the type of guy to just boast or brag about everything that he's doing. And <clears throat> you, know, you get a lot of fools online that look at the, the few sound clips and the sound bites and they hear the hard preaching, right? The hell, hellfire, brimstone, damnation preaching, and oh, he's not loving. And, you know, and, and they make all these, these wicked accusations, never having met the man once. Oh, he's got so much hate in his heart. How can a man so hateful? You know, because, they say, uh, because he believes God's word. Because he says the sound of might ought to be put to death because that's what God said. That's right. And he's repeating what the Bible says. Oh, he's so hateful. But they don't know him at all. And look, I know you know him. Those of you that are visiting, I know him. And, and, it, and it angers me. And what angers me the most is when people bring up stuff from years ago because I don't, like, Brother Segura is there. But not, most people weren't from the, you know, the, mo the most recent things that have been coming up. But I was there. I was there since they were meeting in the house. And Pastor Anderson is a man that, that is very selfless. And I know you know this, but I just, I, you know, this is so important with someone who's doing such a good influence that people are, uh, you know, with all the attacks that have been coming lately, it needs to be said. And someone else needs to stand up and say, no, you know, this is a man of God. Amen. And <clears throat> there ought not to be all these you know, accusation and people are not to be getting deceived by all these accusations that are being put out there because I'll tell you what, the whole story is not being put out there. Right. It simply isn't. And I'm a witness. Back in the early years, there was problems going on. And, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail. There was problems going on, though, where there was a lot of single young guys in the church that ended up getting very proud, proudful, very, very pride, prideful. And um, <clears throat> this happens a lot in general. This is something that everyone needs to look out for, just in general, in your spiritual growth. When you get saved and um, you start going through like a growth spurt, you start hearing a lot of good preaching, you start learning a lot, you know, it's exciting. You start getting sin out of your life, you start going soul winning, it's really exciting. And, and praise God for that. Look, I experience the same type of growth, but you need to be able to handle that and, and understand where you are spiritually still. People who, you know, they get saved, they get on fire for God, and then like a year later, they've read most of their Bible and all this stuff, and then they start to think they know everything. Because there's so many other false teachers out there, so many other, you know, pastors that aren't really doing a good job of explaining and they have milk toast sermons and stuff and they start thinking, oh man, I know more than this guy and I know more than this guy. And they start getting lifted up in themselves. It's like, you know, when, when, a, when a young child, when they start doing things and get a little bit more responsibility, when they're seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, they start thinking they're a little bit older than they really are. It's the same thing spiritually. People have a tendency to get a little bit too lifted up in themselves and prideful. And that's when you start having this attitude. Well, who does the pastor think he is? I'm saved. I got the Holy Spirit too. Who does he think he is? He's the elder. He's the spiritual elder. And you just got saved as a result of his preaching the word of God to you. And you learned everything you know now because he's teaching you from the Bible. And now you're going to just come up and just spout off your mouth against the man of God. Oh, spiritual infant. And look, this happens. The Bible says knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And we need to remember that. You could get a lot of knowledge. You could learn a lot of things. But be careful it doesn't lift you up. The way that you're going to stay humble is by doing the work. That's where the charity comes in, where you care about other people. You're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking, oh, I'm so smart. I know so much. I have so much. Oh, I know more than the pastor. I know more than this person. I know more than that person. That's not charitable. What does that do for anybody? Charity means you're caring for other people. It means you're focused on other people. You're preaching the gospel to other people. You're doing the work for other people. You're being a minister. That keeps you humble. 
That will prevent you from being lifted up. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, some of the things that were happening at that time, as I was mentioning, was, you know, there was a whole group of guys that had this attitude. And look, it needed to be dealt with. It was a problem. And people want to take the response that Pastor Anderson had to these issues that were going on and try to slander his character for responding the way that he did against the, the attacks on his authority in the church. But you're not going to hear about that. You're not going to hear people talk about, you know, the, the group of guys that set up their own soul winning time at the same exact time that the church had a soul winning time because they were moved from, from a job of leadership over that soul winning time and just completely just starting their own faction of people to go off. And you say, oh, but they're doing a good work. Yeah, directly in contradiction to what the church is doing. You're not going to hear about that, though. And I'm not going to go and rehash a lot of this stuff because it's so old anyways. But watch out for the people that want to dig up whatever kind of dirt they think they could find. What are you doing to help the cause? When you're bringing up stuff from seven years ago, ten years ago, what, do you, what is the point? Can you look at the fruit, at the work, at everything that's being done? Right, right. I, I am very suspicious. Why, why are they doing it? What's, you know, right. what's the end point? What's the goal of that? It's to destroy and to damage. And it's not even like it's true. There's a lot of half-truths in what's going on out there. Yep. A lot of half-truths. And I'm not going to take, the, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the drama as much as possible, but if you want to know more specifically, you could come talk to me. I'm a witness to, ev to just about everything that was going on at that church. And if you have any doubts, if you don't like the way, you know, and people are like, oh, I don't like the way Pastor Anderson handled this or handled that. Well, look at the way that God handled the people who were trying to split the church. Amen. He opened up the earth and they were swallowed up into hell. Amen. Okay, would you rather have that? I mean, is that, is, that, is that really what you want? Because I think, I think the way that Pastor Anderson dealt with things is appropriate. And here's why. And here's, and here's what Korah and, and Dathan and Abiram didn't understand. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 13. God has put pastors, elders, in positions of authority in the church. Okay? And you ought to, you ought to treat people with respect that are in that position. And I don't even, you know, well, just let's look at Hebrews 13. Look at verse number seven. The Bible says, remember them which have the rule over you. Now, remember the qualifications for a bishop? Is there supposed to be one that rules well his own household? Because how shall he rule the house of God? Right? How, how, how is he going to, how is he going to care for the house of God? How is he going to look over and administer and, and run things within the church if he can't even rule his own household well? Verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God. So this isn't talking about governors and, and state employees. This is talking about within the house of God because, look, they're speaking unto you the word of God whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. There are people that have, look, the pastors have the rule over you. When you're within this church, now it doesn't mean they're going to tell you everything that you're going to do with your life and micromanage your life, but within the church, the pastor's the one deciding the way things are going to be run. Amen. It's not left up to a board of deacons. It's not left up to a vote by the church. There is someone that God has put in authority to have the rule. And that's the way things are run. And you ought to be respecting the man that has that authority in that position. Amen. And when I, respect, when I say respect, I'm not talking about throwing out God's law and just listening to everything that they say regardless of the Bible, that's being a respecter of persons. But have respect for the man of God who is preaching faithfully, who is preaching the word of God and, and respect the position that they're in. And look, if you don't agree with the way things are going, they've been given that authority. Look at verse number 17. Again, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. 
And this is exactly what we saw with Moses. The Bible says to obey them and to submit yourselves. Did Dathan and Abiram submit themselves unto Moses and Aaron? No. It says, for they watch for your souls. That's exactly what Moses and Aaron were doing. They watched, they cared about them. They were treating God. God, please don't destroy them. They're watching for their souls because they're the ones who are responsible. That, that elder, that pastor is the one that's responsible for the group. I'm responsible for this church. God's going to be coming to me. I'm the watchman here. So it's going to come down on me. And look, so I better make sure I'm watching for your souls. I want to do it with joy and not with grief. How is it going to be a grief when everyone's speaking bad and slandering and, and being rebellious and not going along with the program? That's a grief. Now, is it still my job to watch over souls? Yeah, it is. But you better believe Moses and Aaron were grieved when they were humbling themselves and getting on their face and, try, you know, and, and trying to still rescue these people who are completely ungrateful and, and rebellious and, and being deceived by all these wicked doers. <clears throat> but the authority is still there. The Bible says, uh, turn if you would to Numbers 12. We're just going to see one more example. <clears throat> I'm going to read for you in Psalm 106. The Bible says, They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram, and a fire was kindled in their company, and the flame burned up the wicked. They were envious. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 106 about Korah, Dathan, and Byron. They didn't care about the people. They didn't say, oh, you're not applying God's word properly and the people are being deceived because you're not applying God's word properly. That's not, that's not the attitude they had. They didn't care about the people. No, they were envious of the position that Moses and Aaron had. They wanted to be the ones in charge. So that's when they tried to bring them down and say, oh, no, who do you think you are? Because they envied them. <coughs> Numbers chapter 12, we're going to see another cause here. I think, I, my opinion here is why the congregation was led away uh, so easily uh, and to the degree that it was is because in Numbers 12, this event happened prior to what happened in number 16. There was a problem within the leadership. There's a problem within uh, you with Moses and Aaron and Miriam, where Miriam and, and Aaron were not showing their respect unto Moses. And they were, they were calling him out. Look at verse number one of Numbers chapter 12. The Bible says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, what business is that? What is it? Why should they care at all about some Ethiopian woman that Moses marries? What does that have to do with anything? But no, here they are speaking against Moses. They don't like her for whatever reason. The Bible doesn't say exactly why. Why don't they like her? I don't know. But for whatever reason, they want to speak against Moses now because of who he married. Verse number two, and they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. So now what are they doing? They're saying the same exact thing that Dathan and Abiram, look, they were giving here an opportunity for Dathan and Abiram now to, to, to add on to that and to perpetuate this, hey, let's speak against Moses. Hey, let's speak against the man of God. Let's, let, you know, who does he think he is? Didn't God also speak by us? And look, and this makes the Lord very angry also. Now, they're not wolves, they're not the wicked people that God's destroying by opening up the earth. But look at what happens. Verse number three. Now the man of Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth, and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. 
Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And God rebukes them. Look, when there's a man of God obviously doing the works of the Lord, how could anyone say, how could Aaron or Miriam say that God was not using Moses mightily in all that he had done? And even Aaron, I mean, think about it. The only reason Aaron was even brought into the situation to begin with was because Moses didn't feel confident in doing the job. He said, look, God, you know, I can't do Why don't you just have someone who can speak a little bit better than me? So God says, fine. He listens to, Aaron, to, to Moses and he says, Aaron could do the speaking. He could be the one that's doing public. But you know what? You're going to be as God to him. So even when Aaron was brought into this, he wasn't the main person that God was dealing with. Yet now, because he doesn't like who Moses married, now he's, he's willing to speak up against them and say, you know, oh, well, why can't I be the one? You know, he's, got, he's let it go into his head. Instead of having respect for Moses, having respect for the man of God, having respect for him that's obviously doing a great work for the Lord. And, and God says, look, aren't you afraid to speak against him? There's a healthy fear that people ought to have, I think is just completely gone in our, from, from our culture and other reasons, you know, of, of, of speaking against people who are doing the, the work of the Lord. Amen. I mean, you really ought to fear. And this is what the Bible says. It ought to be a fearful thing for you to just raise up your voice and make railing accusations against a man of God who's going out and doing a great work for God. Amen. You ought to be fearful. I'm not saying that all men of God are perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. Nobody, no man is going to be perfect. And I'm not saying it's possible for a great man of God to backslide and need to be confronted or need to be rebuked. I'm not saying that that's never going to happen. But there's a way to deal with that. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. There's a way to deal with these things appropriately. And that ought to be a rare occasion anyways. You're not just bringing up every little thing to disrespect the man of God about. Like, he married an Ethiopian woman. That's ridiculous. And God says, you ought to be afraid to speak against him. There ought to be more fear. Look at, I mean, look at the fear that David had in when Saul was out to kill him. King Saul was going against David. And he says, I can't lift up my hand to God's anointed. Amen. Because he had so much respect for the authority that God had endued on King Saul and him being anointed to be the king of Israel. David's like, I can't lift up my hand against him. He's anointed by the Lord. Right. And when you got a man of God anointed by God, doing the work of God, you ought to be afraid to speak out against that man of God. Look at verse number 17, 1 Timothy chapter 5. The Bible says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now look, this doesn't say all elders just everywhere be counted worthy of double honor. It says they that rule well. So the elder that's not doing anything for God, that just has everything goes in church, doesn't care about the people, he's not preaching on sin, he's not doing this stuff. Are they worthy of double honor? No. They're not ruling well. But you know what? When you got someone who's ruling well, when you got someone who's leading the, leading the church and, and doing the great works, hey, count, they're worthy of double honor, especially they that labor in the word and doctrine. People are laboring, doing the work, and, and teaching good doctrine and, and going in and teaching a lot, you know, a lot of scripture. They ought to be worthy of double honor. Why? Because they're putting in so much work. I mean, they're working hard for you. They care about you. They're looking out for you. But people don't realize that. You know, people get their, you know, the, the man of God, the, the preacher, is going to preach on some sin that you're doing and because he loves you, because he wants you to get right with God, because he wants you to do the things that are right and that you could know what the Bible says. And what's the reaction oftentimes? Oh, man, I, why do you have to say that? And you end up not liking, you know, and, and having this, this personal problem because he's preaching the word of God. <clears throat> you need to have the proper mindset attitude. Now, look, if he's preaching God's word, you don't have a problem with the, with the preacher. You have a problem with God. 
Bible says in verse 18, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Verse 19, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. This is the level of, you know, when, when there is a problem, when there's an accusation. He says, first of all, you don't receive an accusation. So what does that mean when someone comes to you talking bad about the pastor against the elder? Don't receive their accusation unless they're willing to say it before two or three witnesses and establish every word and say, no, this is actually what happened. And you have a few people saying, yep, no, I saw this. I mean, if someone were saying, look, I'm not above sin. I'm not above rebuke or being wrong or, or backsliding. If I were to, you know, if I were to really backslide and just go off to the bar one night and get drunk and people see like, hey, I saw Pastor Burson's coming out of the bar. Look, that needs to be dealt with. I'm not saying, you know, be afraid to, 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 to confront that, that type of a wicked sin, because that needs to be dealt with. Look, if a drunkard's going to be kicked out of the church and, and remove fellowship from, I think the pastor, ought, you know, <laughs> needs to be dealt with and, and put away also. But if someone just doesn't like him and they just want to throw some railing accusation out there, you don't receive that except unless it be before two or three witnesses. And then notice verse 20, it says, them that sin rebuke before all. Them is plural. That's not referring to the elder. That's referring to those that sin, bearing false witnesses, rebuke before all. And um, that others also may fear. Why are the other people need for? Because you don't want other people then being encouraged to bring up a false witness. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're almost done. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, where we were, verse number 1, I'm just going to do this right now because I'm not going to get to this last page of notes. The Bible says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Now, I think, honestly, I believe that, the, that the, the, the primary focus of this is talking about people who are older, I mean, an elder. When it says, rebuke not an elder and treat him as a father, because then it goes on to talk about the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters with all purity. This is the way that you deal with people in church. I mean, you have an older man, hey, treat him like a father. Treat him with respect. Amen. You have a, a younger man, hey, treat him as your brother. Amen. With respect that way. Elder women, treat him like a mom. Okay, this is the primary focus of this. But you know what? It's not wrong to apply the rebuke, not an elder, to the pastor of the church, but in treat him as father. Here's why. Because spiritually, he is the elder. Spiritually, he should, you know, he, you know, unless he's a novice, which the Bible talks against, he's not some spiritual baby up here. He's your spiritual idol. You ought to deal with him as such. You know, there's a lot of people who have been saved maybe for more years than I have. I've been saved for 20 years. Maybe even saved for 40 years. I don't know. But that doesn't mean that spiritually you're more grown. Just because a man's, you know, spiritually you could grow faster than your physical age. It's possible. And someone who's been putting forth the work and studying to show themselves approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed and is deemed so by a local congregation that says, hey, this person fits the bill. This person's not a novice. This person knows what to talk about. This person is qualified to pastor and to lead a church. They're the spiritual leader. I mean, as the fathers, you're the spiritual leader in the home. And you ought to be respected as such in the home. And you ought to be respecting the elder in the church. And that's why I don't think, even though the primary service on that verse, I do think it's talking about just people who are older in age, like physical age. It can easily be applied to the spiritual age as well. The problem that seems to be rampant today is that there's a lot of people that get saved, they start to learn, you know, they hear the preaching, clean up their lives, like I mentioned earlier, and they get to a point and lift it up because they don't realize they're still novices. And that's why the, the Bible warns about the pastor not being a novice. Why? Because they get lifted up with pride and fall into condemnation and the snare of the devil. That's why. That's the whole purpose of not being a novice and pastoring a church is because the whole problem is that you might get lifted up with pride and think highly of yourself. Well, 
that's not only a problem for someone who's going to pastor a church. It could be a problem for any believer. When they're a novice, but they think more highly of themselves. Look at um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. And we see here a lot of the attributes of Dath and Abiram, but we also see attributes of people who just get lifted up with pride, people who don't consent to wholesome words, who don't um, receive the doctrines of God. It says a proud, they know nothing, and they start doting about questions and strives of words and start trying, trying to attack every little thing and, and, and really make a big deal just out of, out of words that shouldn't be a, a big problem. And it says, it come, whereof cometh envy. And remember, that was a problem that Dathan and Abiram had. They were envious of Moses, envious of the position. And strife, his fightings, railings. So all these things they did against Moses. They railed against them. Evil surviving. That's from such, withdraw thyself. Withdraw thyself from those, from those people. <clears throat> I had some more notes. So I'm not going to get to them. It's getting kind of late. But... This is kind of a problem in general in our society with just not being able to respect people who are in positions of authority, who are in, um, you know, the, the father in the home. Kids are starting to grow up not respecting their parents. You know, teachers, no more respect for teachers anymore. No more, you know, anybody who's in a position that you ought to be respecting that. Even elderly people. There's no more respect for older people anymore. There used to be. But the society has turned into a society of people who just think about themselves and are lifted up in themselves. And they're more important than everybody else instead of having the attitude and the mindset of esteeming other people better than yourself. When you esteem others better than yourself, you're automatically going to be respecting them. I mean, we ought to have basic respect just for other people in general, let alone people who are in other positions that deserve more respect. One last point I'm going to touch on, because I don't want to leave this one out, is the respect in the home. Not just for the parents from the kids, but from the wife to the husband. God is our authority and he demands our respect. The Bible said in Hebrews 13 that, you know, the, the, that the person who's teaching you the word of God is the one who's in authority and they ought to be respected and in the home the husband is the head of the household and he's the one in authority and he ought to be respected our culture today is teaching women to disrespect their husbands and do whatever they think they want to do and not listen to one word that her husband says oh you don't have to do what he says oh you could be your own person oh you could you could make who does he think he is Think of all the attributes that we just heard about days and environment, all the things that they said, and apply that now to the home. Ladies, don't be a Dathan and a Byram and bringing up all these things and, and being rebellious against your husband. The husband has authority over the wife and is made in the image of God. The wife was the one who was designed to be a help for the husband, not a hindrance. Now look, the husband ought to love the wife as Christ the church. Just like Moses and Aaron loved the congregation. And even when they were being rebellious, they still loved the congregation. And husbands, your job is to love your wife, even when they may be being rebellious. But ladies, don't make it a, a, a hindrance. Don't make it a problem. Don't make it a burden on your husband to love you. 
because you're being so rebellious against them. Recognize the authority and respect your husband. Now, being in obedience, Ephesians chapter 5, we're not going to read all this. You could read it later. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, many other places in the Bible that, that outline the, the, the man, the husband being the head of the household. But I'll tell you, I'll leave you with this. Obedience is not obeying your husband just when you agree with him. Oh, yeah, we're on the same page. Oh, yeah, I'm such an obedient wife because, you know, my husband wants me to do this and I wanted to do it anyway, so I'm going to listen and do that. That's not what defines obedience. It's when you have a disagreement. That's going to determine where your heart is and how much respect you have for your husband. It's when he says to do something and you don't want to do it. And you disagree. And you think that's stupid. And you think there's a better way of doing it. And you, you know, no, that's not what I want to do. Well, if you're obedient, you're just going to do it anyways and not murmur and complain about it. Amen. And that's the level of respect. Look, it's not popular today. Oh, I can't believe you male chauvinist pig. What do you, you know, your patriarchy. Look, shut up. It's what the Bible says. I don't care. I don't care what this world's going to say. I don't care what Satan wants to teach for your, your family. It's not working. Why do you think the divorce rate's so high? Ultimate authority goes to God. Obviously, and, and look, this supersedes everything. If the man of God is going contrary to the authority of God, don't listen to him. Don't respect that person when they're con contradicting God. But when they're not contradicting God, you have respect on them and they have authority. When you're at the home, ladies, your husband has authority. The Bible says, obey him in everything. But if your husband is telling you to do something that contradicts God, hey, God's your authority. Don't, you don't have to listen to them in that situation. But if it's not contradicting God's word, if it's not contradicting scripture, and they're telling you to do something, well, now they have that authority over you. It's the same thing. There needs to be more respect in our society, more respect for people who are given positions that God has put them in. Not that they've taken upon themselves, but the position that God has given them, whether it be in the church, whether it be at home, wh wherever it may be. When God says that we need to be respecting people, we need to be respecting people. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us to be, uh, to be lights that shine in this dark world. Dear God, help us to um, be able to live our lives as proof that we do believe your word, dear God, that we do treat your word seriously and that we are going to give respect where respect is due and that we're going to live our lives and, and not be, allow ourselves to be deceived by these people who want to just come in and split churches and, uh, and just cause a great harm unto the cause of Christ, dear Lord, but that we could stay focused on doing what's right and, um, and just be in the positions that we're in and, and learn to uh, ultimately learn to be, to be humble and to be ministers and servants for you, dear Lord, and that we won't have to worry about lifting ourselves up, but, but just let you uh, do that when you see fitness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.